So we listen to Jayadev. We'll uh, talk about the SL2R action on the space of differential. Great. So first of all, thank you to the organizers for putting together such a wonderful meeting and giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, the, uh, you know, from my perspective, the standard of talks has been extremely high, and I want to try and maintain that. And what my goal is to actually to pull a couple of threads from, from talks that we heard uh, both last week and this week, particularly Bertrand and, and Stefano's talks, uh, and bring together a couple of those ideas. So Stefano spent a few minutes discussing uh, translation surfaces as examples of branched projective structures, as very simple examples where you have a representation into an abelian group. And so the next two lectures are really going to spend a lot of time sort of expanding on that, talking a lot about translation surfaces, telling you what they are, trying to give you some examples. And then one of the things that's really lovely about translation surfaces is that there's a, there's a big group that acts on the space of translation surfaces. So fundamentally, you know, while I love geometry, fundamentally, I'm a dynamics person. So I need something to move around. So I need a big group acting on something. And so this is why I really love this particular sub-collection of projective structures or branch projective structures coming from translation surfaces. The other thread that I want to pull from previous talks is Bertrand spent his talks giving this absolutely gorgeous introduction to the idea of Lyapunov exponents in a geometric context. And so I want to spend some time showing you how Lyapunov exponents arise in the study of translation surfaces. And if we have a little bit of time, I'll also try and discuss a little bit about the historical origins of Lyapunov exponents, where, where they come from, from, they actually, in some sense, come from probability theory and multiplying matrices together. They're coming from multiplying random matrices together. And I want to try and, and hint at that and show you how the story of translation surfaces connects to multiplying random matrices. Okay, so for, for those of you who were in Lumini in 2015, these slides are gonna look familiar. I used them there. Um, and, and also to the experts in the room, apologies. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on some of the basic definitions in dynamics, because I know this is more of a geometry crowd, but so apologies if I'm saying things that are extremely well known. Uh, the goal is, I really want, you know, this is, the goal is for this to be accessible to all the students in the room. Okay. So, we have this motivating quote, uh, which sounds very fancy. I remember actually getting this paper from my advisor to read when I was in graduate school, this paper with this amazing title, Lyapunov Exponents and Hodge Theory. And uh, the paper terrified me. Um, but now I go back, and it's, it's, it's actually a really incredible and beautiful paper. It's from 1997, and it has this amazing sentence at the beginning. We started from computer experiments with simple one-dimensional ergodic dynamical systems and quite unexpectedly ended with topological string theory. So my goal is to... Okay, I know what one side of that is. I know what simple one-dimensional ergodic dynamical systems are. I don't really know what topological string theory is, but maybe cross that out and say moduli spaces of geometric structures. As far as I can tell, that's kind of what they meant uh, when they said topological string theory. Um, and uh, it, when you ask Anton about this, he also mumbles some stuff. Maybe Maxime you know, can tell you what string theory is. I'm sure he can. Uh, I can't. Um, OK, so our, our, the, the main ideas that we're going to try and share is we're going to talk about this SL2R action on a space of differentials. And it's going to be really important because there's going to be an example we're going to describe what Lyapunov exponents associated with this action are, and we're also going to, I'm going to try and describe, this is a place where these numerical invariants, these Lyapunov exponents, can be calculated and are actually geometrically extremely meaningful. And you can use, you can actually, all of you probably, with a couple of hours, oh, maybe hours, maybe not, a couple of days could write a very easy computer program to compute some of these numbers. And so I want to show you that these things are actually all very much, I mean, I think, one of the lovely things about the lectures here so far is everybody has computed, right? You know, we spent a lot, good chunk of the last lecture trying to compute things by hand. And, you know, again, I'll give you the same disclaimer as Francois. There might be some minus signs and so on that go wrong. But the goal of this is to show you that a lot of this stuff can be explicitly by hand computed. So what is this stuff? Okay. So our sort of goals, our main goals in this are going to be to understand the connection between the devi what's something called the deviation of ergodic averages for the simple one-dimensional dynamical systems called interval exchange transformations, and 
the Lie operator exponents for Teichmuller flow. Really, the goal is for you to have some understanding of what all the words on this slide mean at the end of these two lectures. Um, that's basically going to be the first lecture and a half. Originally, I prepared these notes for three 50-minute lectures. Um, but then in the second part, I'm going to start to talk a little bit about how we can use the SL2 action in another way to count uh, some important kinds of trajectories on translation surfaces and to compute some things which are called Ziegel Veach constants. And maybe at the end, try and connect Lyapunov exponents and Ziegel Veach constants. There's going to be a lot of numbers in this talk, starting with geometry, though. OK, and I want to point you to some sources. Uh, None of these sources are state-of-the-art. The, the state-of-the-art is moving so fast in this subject that if I tried to give you state-of-the-art sources, they, they would not be already. There would be somebody writing a new survey or something. However, I still think that these, these sources are incredibly important because they really uh, give you an idea of some of the basics of the material. So this is Giovanni Forni's, and I'll, I'll be happy to share these, uh, these slides. If there's a website for the conference, I'm happy to you know, send, put a PDF version up so you don't have to to write these down right now. Uh, Forney has a beautiful uh, survey in the Handbook of Dynamical Systems, this Konsevich and Zorich paper. Uh, Howie Mazur has, an, has a beautiful paper in the same Handbook edition. And then Anton Zorich's original paper on the deviation for interval exchange transformations is really kind of a masterpiece that if you're at all interested in this subject, I strongly suggest you read. Um, I'll get to these ones. This is for the counting problems. There's one by Alex Eskin and one by Eskin and Mazur, uh, and there's some more later. Okay, so I want to start. We've so far we've been talking everything. Most of the things we've been doing have been in two dimensions, right? We've been talking about surfaces. Let me drop one dimension down and start to talk about one-dimensional uh, one-dimensional things. Let's talk about intervals. Okay. And I want to talk about a very simple family of maps of intervals called interval exchange transformations. Okay. So first of all, what is an interval exchange transformation? It's a very, very simple idea. Think of your interval as a piece of string. Cut your piece of string up into various pieces of various lengths. And now you have piece one, piece two, piece three, up to piece n. And let's say you have a permutation of n things. Rearrange the pieces of your interval according to the permutation and stitch them back together. So this is a map of a unit interval to itself, or a, a whatever length interval, to back to the same length interval. It's a piecewise isometry, right? It's mapping this piece down to this piece. So uh, this, this uh, I don't know how clear this picture is. Is that so? You can sort of see an example of an interval exchange map. So here, the, the piece on the right goes to the piece on the bottom right, and so on and so forth. So this is the permutation. This is four intervals, and this is the permutation four, three, two, one. Right? So I've cut it up into four pieces. The first interval becomes the fourth. The second interval becomes the third. The third interval becomes the second. And the, the fourth interval becomes the first. OK. So this is a, it's clearly a family of maps, right? I, depending on where, you know, if I fix a permutation and I fix an interval, I still have lots of choices. In fact, I have sort of three choices here about where to cut, right? How long my first interval is, second interval is, third interval is. But if I fix the total length of the interval, I really only have three choices. So it's kind of a three-dimensional space of these things. And the first question you should ask me is, okay, so, so, okay, so these are piecewise isometries, wonderful. Okay, who cares? Why should I care about an interval exchange transformation? Where does it sort of come from? It's a fine. You've defined a map that it has some reasonable properties. It's, a piece, it's an isometry, so it's of the form really x. It's orientation preserving, right? It's x. Locally, it's sort of x goes to x plus something. Um, why should I care about it, right? It's, it preserves Lebesgue measure, right, clearly, because I'm just doing some translations. It's not continuous, though. Right? It has these four discontinuity points. Well, you should care about it because it connects to the geometry of surfaces, right? Everybody in this room cares about the geometry of surfaces. Um, so let's, and I'm going to try and outline to you how this connects. So let me just remind you, okay, the parameters we need for such a map are a permutation pi on n letters and lambda as a vector in, in the positive cone in Rn, right? Well, one nice geometric connection 
is that if I take an interval exchange of two intervals, and I urge you to do this exercise, it's actually just a rotation of the circle. Okay? If, you, if you exchange two intervals, let's say your whole interval has length one, then the ex interval exchange map of two intervals is simply a rotation of the circle. It is actually exactly just a rotation of the circle. The best way to see this is to actually draw a map of the rotation of a circle as a map from 0, 1 to 0, 1. When I say rotation of the circle, I think of the circle as 0, 1, and I think of x goes to x plus alpha mod 1. Equivalently, right, it's multiplication by e to the 2 pi i alpha under the map if I map x to e to the 2 pi i x, right? So this is a rotation of a circle. Well, a rotation of a circle is something that has a connection to geometry of surfaces. If I take a torus, a flat torus, and I flow along lines of constant slope, that is, if I take a foliation of the, of the torus, a straight line foliation of the torus, the, the return map to a transverse interval will exactly be a rotation. What do I mean by this, right? So where do how does rotations connect to geometry? I have a flat torus and I have some foliation of slope alpha, let's say. So this is height alpha here. And if I, now, if I start at zero here, and I look at the return to this, let's say, so now what happens here? The, the bit from zero to sort of, so zero goes to alpha, zero up to maybe, maybe one minus alpha is here. So zero to one minus alpha gets sent to alpha to one, right? This bit gets sent to this bit, and then this, the rest, the yellow part, gets sent to the yellow part. Right? So it's an exchange of two intervals. And it comes from this geometry of the surface. So what else, why should we care about the other stuff? Well, like I was saying, it's connection to moduli spaces of geometric structures on surfaces, right? That's what we all care about in this room. So what are these geometric structures on surfaces? Well, they're precisely these things called translation surfaces. So these were, so far in this conference, were introduced by Stefano when he talked about branched projective structures. Okay, so remember a branched projective structure was, okay, so I had an atlas of, one way to think about it is I have an atlas of charts away from a finite set of points, the branch points, where the transition maps are projective maps, and then near the branch points, I had to maybe take a power, right? I'm, I'm paraphrasing, to get this kind of, of, of chart. So what if now I restrict, you know, certainly translations are projective transformations. <laughs> so let me really restrict, right? I, you know, that's too big, you know, I, I don't, I'm scared of non-abelian groups, so let's take all my charts to live in an abelian group. And let's take these, these translations. And so now, obviously, we're going to call our surface, if we call something, we have an atlas of charts where the transitions are projective, projective structure, we're going to call it a translation structure or translation surface. So given a topological surface S of genus, oh, there's a typo there, it should be genus something, genus G. A translation structure on S is an atlas of charts from S away from a finite set of points to C whose transition maps are translations. Okay, that sounds kind of fancy, but it's very, very concrete. The first important example is, well, take an actual quotient of C. Take a quotient of C by a group of translations, and of course you'll get such a structure. And so, for instance, if you don't insist on compactness, a cylinder is a nice translation surface, right? C mod Z, just one, one direction of translation. But let's say you want a compact sur surface, then you're going to take C mod two directions of translation, and you'll get a flat torus. So for instance, if you take, you know, this is the lattice, probably Z adjoined I, and you get this torus. And notice that I've drawn this graph paper on this torus to indicate that really, while I've drawn it, you know, the, of course, the way I've drawn it here, if I think about it geometrically, there's sort of positive curvature on the outside and negative curvature on the inside. I really want to think about it as flat everywhere, right? It's C mod a lattice. I have a natural flat metric, and the graph paper is there to kind of remind me. Now, what about higher genus? Now, very simply, I can't express 
a higher genus surface is a quotient of the complex plane by a group of translations, right? It would fail gauss bonnet gauss bonnet would fail miserably. I, I need curvature. So what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to shove all my curvature to a finite set of points. I'm going to concentrate all of my curvature at these branch points. Right? So my branch points are going to be where all my curvature lives. So I'm going to draw you some genus 2 translation surfaces that I really like. Uh, by the way, I am shamelessly in this talk stealing pictures from my friends in the translation surface community. This picture is a beautiful picture from Anton Zorich's uh, this first one of the, of the regular octagon. So, okay, we started with the square. So, so, so when we go back and think about that torus example, well, another way of thinking about it is we took a parallelogram, or in this case, in the first picture, we drew a square, and we identified opposite sides, right? We played Pac-Man or maybe uh, Aliens or something like this, right? One of these computer games where you go off the top of the screen, you come up the bottom, you go off the right side of the screen, you come up the left side, right? Actually, it's funny, I, I, I made this, I was teaching a graduate course and I made a Pac-Man reference and none of my PhD students actually like had played Pac-Man. And so this was, it's, it's, it's really bad when you know, you're sort of aging out like on your cultural references this way, but hopefully some people know what Pac-Man is. Um, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, can you come to my graduate courses? <laughs> so. Okay, so the natural thing you might want to do is you might say, well, if I take, you know, you know, you're, we're all surface people here. So if I take a sort of a 2G gon, I should get a, or 4G gon, I should get a genus G surface, right? Um, and so maybe that's the thing I should do. Well, maybe the first thing I should do is I should just look at a hexagon and see what happens, a 4G plus 2 gon. But a hexagon, if you glue opposite sides, a good exercise is see is you get a torus with two marked points. So with the square, you got one marked point, zero, and here you'll get two marked points. So now let's go to the octagon and glue opposite sides. And uh, I'll take, so there's this terrible joke uh, that somebody suggested saying, what you're doing is you're completing the square. Um, Mahan has heard this joke now twice in three weeks and doesn't like it any better. <laughs> um, so what you do to see that you get a genus two surface, this is, I think it's a nice way to convince your friends if, you, if you're trying to convince your friends that you get a genus two surface out of an octagon is you think about it as a torus with a hole cut out of it, a square hole cut out of it, and then you're gluing opposite sides of the square hole, and that gives you another handle. And so you get a genus 2 surface. And now you can actually see on this genus 2 surface here, I still have graph paper, right? I have these graph paper structures, but if you look at sort of where the two handles kind of come together, you can see there there are going to be 12 squares of graph paper that, that, that meet at that point. Everywhere else has four. Everywhere else looks like a perfectly reasonable Euclidean point, but that point has angle three times two pi. It has six pi angle, 1,080 degrees. 12 times 90 is the, uh, is the angle at that point. An exercise, a really good exercise to do, more generally, take a regular 4G gon, a Euclidean 4G gon, identify opposite sides. You will get a genus G surface, with one singular point, all the, the negative curvature is concentrated to that one singular point, and the angle will be 4G minus 2 times pi. Okay. And now, or, or in particular, 2G minus 1 times 2 pi is maybe a better way to put it. Another example, which turns out to be not actually all that different, is an L-shaped table, um, and now the colors indicate the, the gluings. The line in the middle is just there to indicate that that's a nice closed curve on this surface, right? That's a nice closed curve on the surface. But, you know, if you're a topologist, you stare at this and you say, well, this is also an octagon. It should also give you a genus 2 surface. And it does. And if you follow the singular point around, the corner around, you'll see that all eight of those points collapse to one point, and again, the angle is 6 pi, or 1,080 degrees. Okay, what about something that doesn't have just one singular point? If you take a tengon, a decagon, and identify parallel sides by translation again, you get a genus 2, uh, genus two surface with two singular points, each one with angle 4 pi. And more generally, if you take a 4G plus 2 gon, you'll get a genus G surface 
where uh, with two singular points, each, each with angle sort of 2 pi times g, or 2g times pi. Okay. This is, again, a, a very good exercise. So these are examples of translation surfaces. But of course, uh, you know, the, we, have the, we have the regular decagon and the regular octagon, but maybe a, a better place to focus is this L, because it's very clear that this L comes with a, you know, in a massive family of Ls, right? There's clearly parameters around here. I label the sides A, B, C, and D because I can pick whatever A, B, C, and D I want and make an L, and it seems likely that they're not always going to be the same as translation surfaces. Maybe I got very unlucky and somehow I picked A, B, and C, D. you know, if you, you picked one and I picked one, but it's probably, I can, I can wiggle around at least locally, and I have deformation space of translation surfaces. I have a moduli space of translation surfaces. You can even see this with the octagon, because really with the oct octagon, I didn't need it to be regular. I just needed each side to have a parallel side of the same length that I could glue it to. Okay? So I have a space of translation surfaces, and my goal is going to be to describe a space of translation surfaces. But before I do that, let me indicate here what the connection to an IET is going to be. If you start off on this L, and I have this closed curve here, and now I start, so, so what's, what's a good thing about translation? Translation, for instance, preserves direction, right? So in particular, I know what way is up, right? I have a vertical direction. So in particular, I know what way is, if I say, angle theta with the horizontal, that means something, or slope means something, right? So maybe I go at some angle here, and I, and I start, maybe I start on here and I flow, and so maybe I go here, and then that ends up here, that ends up down here, and now I've ended up here. So there's a map, an induced map on this subinterval, which says, start here and look where I come back. That map is exactly going to be an interval exchange transformation. The discontinuities of this are exactly going to be, well, there's a discontinuity, that's going to be a discontinuity. Um, there'll be a couple of others that I'm not sort of indicating here. I guess, uh, you know, if I, there's sort of the pre-image of any of these singular points, right? So that came here, so that'll be another discontinuity, and so on. Anything that goes and hits a singular point. Okay, so this is the connection to interval exchange transformations and translation surfaces. Let me formalize a little bit this something, you know, about different ways to describe translation surfaces. So we've described them kind of geometrically as polygon with parallel sides glued. We've talked about them as an atlas of charts to, to see away from a finite set of points. And I think it's pretty easy to see how if I have a polygon with parallel sides glued by translation, I have an atlas of charts to see whose transition maps are translations, right? Inside, I just take the, you know, where I am. On an edge, I take a, the half neighborhood here and the half neighborhood here, and that gives me a chart. But let's think complex analytically, right? If you're thinking about moduli spaces of geometric structures on surfaces, especially things when you're gluing, everything you're gluing is, is holomorphic, right? The we're gluing things with translations. So really there's complex an analysis hiding here, right? Because what do I get from this gluing? If I take a surface and I glue things with translations, I certainly get a Riemann surface structure, right? I've glued everything with holomorphic stuff. Okay, finite set of points, whatever. I can always fill in the complex structure at a finite set of points. But more than that, remember I talked about we get a direction up. I talked about we get graph paper. The form, I mean, the, so this comes from your first year calculus class. The crucial thing in this whole story is the following I idea. D of z plus c is dz. So the form dz living on a, think of, of these polygons as living in the complex plane, means now I have a holomorphic one form on my translation surface, dz. If you don't like the language of holomorphic one forms, don't worry. I just have something that tells me how far I go horizontally and how far I go vertically. Right? I have a way of describing distance on the surface, and I have a way of describing direction on the surface. Okay. But I'm guessing everybody here likes holomorphic one forms. Okay. This actually gives us three definitions of translation surfaces. And on this, 
I know you probably will go through the small letters, but you can sort of see one is complex analysis, one is Euclidean geometry, and one is geometric structures. And I have arrows back and forth to show you how to go between the three definitions of a translation surface. So from the complex analytic definition, which is a pair, compact Riemann surface and holomorphic one form, you integrate your one form omega to get charts, that gives you a geometric structure. You can cut up the surface along a basis for homology to get your description as a surface as a polygon glued by translations. Uh, and then to go from the Euclidean geometry to the complex analysis, you pull back dz as we described. To go from the complex to the geometric structure to the complex analysis, also you pull back dz from, the comp from c. And to go between the geometric structure and the Euclidean geometry, you push forward the Euclidean structure and you have a kind of developing map. So let me, this is sort of to indicate that all of these definitions are equivalent, right? So geometric structure, this is the definition we had already. Compact surface, let's, let's, we're going to add compact to a lot of our things now. Atlas of charts away from my finite set of points. Euclidean geometry, a translation surface is given by a collection of polygons, P1 through PK. The L already tells you my definition of polygon does not include the word convex. I don't need my polygons to be convex. But what they have, the, the property they have to have is that the collection of sides can be divided into sets of parallel pairs of the same length, which are then identified by translation. Every side has to have a parallel friend of the same length, a unique parallel friend of the same length. And finally, we have complex analysis. A genus G translation surface is a pair X omega, where X is a compact genus G Riemann surface. Omega is a holomorphic one form. Omega is F of Z, DZ in local coordinates. The zeros of omega correspond to singular points of the flat metric that you get. And a zero of order K yields an angle of k plus 1 times 2 pi. That come, what, what's, where does that calculation come from? Again, let me do basic calculus. Right? d of z to the k plus 1, okay, up to a multiplicative constant is z to the k dz. So if my one form has a zero of order k, locally I kind of look like z to the k plus 1, that's a k plus 1 covering branched over zero. Right? So that gives me angle 2 pi times k plus 1. Stefano already did this calculation for us uh, in his talk. Okay, um, and let me maybe say one sentence about how to go between the Riemann surface version and the atlas of charts. So I have my Riemann surface and my holomorphic one form, and maybe it has some zeros here. So how do I get an atlas of charts? Well, so I have x and I have omega here. Well, let's say I have a non-singular point, p0. In a neighborhood of that point, I'm going to define my chart by, I have some point p, z of p, just going to be the integral from p0 to p of omega. Right? What's nice is that in this coordinate, of course, omega is just dz. Right? Um, and this is your atlas of charts, the transition maps or translations. It's very, very, very concrete. Okay. What's kind of cool about this is you can actually, um, if you're ever, if, if, I don't know why you'd be in this situation, but if somebody were to ever hand you a Riemann surface with an algebraic equation and say dx over y or something is your holomorphic one form, you could actually do this. I mean, none of these integrals is crazy. You can actually compute these integrals in, in explicit cases and get the periods of your holomorphic one form and get an atlas of charts and describe your surface as a Euclidean surface. All of this is extremely concrete, and if you know calculus, you can do these problems. Okay. Okay, before I move on to this problem, these problems of dynamics, I want to ask if there are any questions about the definition of a translation surface. This is the time to ask. I mean, you can ask later also, but this is a good time. All right, it's clear? Okay, excellent. Yeah. Absolutely. So DZ gives you a choice of a direction. And in particular, what you could, and so I'll talk about this in a minute. So each translation surface, I distinguish between the translation surface with the form omega and the form e to the i theta omega, which means I distinguish between the vertical direction and the tilted one. But if you want, you can think of 
you know, here, this is the torus with the flow in direction alpha. You can think of that as the, the Riemann surface is not changing if I multiply by e to the i theta. So you can think of each one as giving you kind of an S1's family's worth of lines and then a family of interval exchange transformations. And so absolutely, but yes, we are talking about, you know, we have a vertical direction. We have a notion of up, we have dz. I'm always going to think of my translation surfaces this way. Okay, so each translation surface, as we said, yields a family of dynamical systems. The directional or straight line flows, or in particular, you can e or you could say each translation surface gives you one dynamical system, but you can also think about just multiplying the one form by e to the i theta. These are the directional or straight line flows. So in complex analytic language, the, the, this is the, you have the vertical flow which would be the leaves of sort of the real part of omega being zero, the horizontal flow, which is the leaves of the imaginary part of omega being zero, and then we have the flow in direction t being the leaves of, you know, sort of the vertical on e to the i t omega. I might be missing a minus sign. So, uh, or you can just, yeah. And I actually... You know, since I'm a dynamicist, I should say that, you know, the reason to care about this flat family, one of the reasons to care about these dynamical systems from translation surfaces is they arise very, very naturally from super, super simple Newtonian mechanics. So when people ask me what I work on, you know, sort of general public, and they ask, you know, what are the applications, I, I tell them about these billiard problems, then they laugh and they say, why would you play billiards on these funny tables? But the point is, it's problems in Newtonian mechanics that we don't know how to answer, right? So there's lots of interesting problems in really simple Newtonian mechanics that we have no idea how to answer. And I'm going to tell you one in just a second. So the idea is we're going to play billiards in a polygon. Now, right now I've written there rational multiples of pi are the angles. But let's say I drop that assumption for a second. Let me say what I mean, first of all, by billiards in a polygon. I mean a, a, a point mass moving at unit speed with no friction on the table. We're mathematicians, after all. We want to make this as simple as possible. And the collisions with the walls are elastic. So the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Here's a problem that we still don't know how to answer. Give me a triangle for, actually, let me put it this way. For, is there a periodic billiard trajectory in every triangle? So we know the answer now, I believe now up to, if all the angles are less than or equal to 112 degrees, I believe. It's a, it's a very easy exercise that I urge you to do if all the angles are less than 90 degrees. This is a very fun and beautiful exercise with a really pleasant solution. Rich Schwartz did numerical experiments and got it to, or, or did a numerical proof of getting it up to 100 degrees that all the angles are less than 100 degrees. And recently, people have pushed Rich's method, I think, up to maybe 112.5 or something like this. But we still don't know the answer is if there's a periodic billiard trajectory in a triangle. So I think this is... I don't think it's embarrassing anymore. I just think it's amazing. Um, however, uh, so, so one of the people who th has thought about billiard, who thought about billiards for a long time was, was Anatol Katok, who passed away a couple of years ago, he both liked the translation surface community and was extremely irritated with us. He was irritated with us. He liked us because we could get some interesting results about billiards. He was extremely irritated with us because we put this condition on that the angles of the polygon are rational multiples of pi. Okay, so once you put that condition on, life becomes much, much easier, and you can go from playing billiards to doing geometric structures on surfaces. So we, he accused us, you know, pretty correctly of being like the, there's a story of the drunk who is looking for the keys, and the policeman comes up to them and says, you know, oh, what are you doing? You know, you're sort of scrabbling around under the street light. Why, you know, what are you doing here? And the drunk says, well, I'm looking for my keys. And the policeman asks him, well, did you lose them over here under this light? And the drunk says, no, no, I lost them in that dark place over there. But the light is very, very good over here. <laughs> so we're going to tell you about where the light is very, very good. So if you play billiards in a polygon whose angles are rational multiples of pi, and now polygon could mean, yes. So 
so, so yes. So, so okay. So it's not going to be a surface anymore. So, so what, what happens here when you play billiards? Right. It'll be a three manifold, and then there won't be. It'll, it'll be. A, it'll be a three manifold, right? Right, because it'll be the, the, the phase space for the billiard will genuinely be the polygon cross S one, and it won't be foliated by invariant surfaces anymore. Right. So here the point is, as you go in a direction theta, if you hit, you can only go on finitely many. The, the group the 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 theta can only take on finitely many values when you hit a side. If your angles are rational multiples of pi, you can only hit finitely many values. So your, your, your uh, phase space, P cross S1, polygon cross S1, is foliated by kind of finitely many copies of each. There's, an in, there's invariant surfaces which are finitely many copies of P. In the, in the uh, Irrational case, there'll be ones which are sort of infinitely many copies of P. Yeah, I mean, so it's foliated by not in, it's foliated by invariant surfaces, just not invariant compact surfaces. Here, the point is we can build an invariant compact surface. But yes, that perspective is being used by Giovanni Forni and others studying the geometric structures on this three manifold to get information about that. But that's still in sort of its infancy compared to this story. But yes, that's a very good point. Okay, so what am I saying here? So polygon, by the way, can mean things with barriers. It can mean things with overlaps, lots of things like that. So here I've drawn a very important example, which is a square with a barrier of height alpha at, at a half. And now I'm going to describe an unfolding procedure. And since this is something that, that, that I think is actually very important, I want to quickly describe it to you just in the simplest possible case, which is billiards in a square. Because it's it's such an important motivating thing, and if you hear if you're hearing about translation surfaces for the first time, this is something important to hear. So let's say I play billiards in a square. So here's my maybe the first part of my billiard trajectory. Uh, what I'm going to do is when I hit the side, instead of flipping the the, the billiard ball, I'm going to flip the table. So one, two, three, four, five, maybe, are my segments. So now segment two goes from BD to AC. And now I flip it over again. Ah, oh, sorry, BA. And now this is segment three. And now I flip over again. Now I have segment four. But now notice, if I were to flip over over, over this, this top side, I get a copy of my original table. So I might as well just think of five as coming back here anyway. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this guy over here. I'm just going to move it by translation. B, B, uh, did I do something wrong? Uh, oh, sorry. And now, if I zoom in on this part, what do I get? I get this glued to this, this is glued to this, and then the, the left side, I get something that's four times as large with the left glued to the right and the top glued to the bottom. So I go from playing billiards to playing Pac-Man. I go to compact surface. Okay? Now, I'm not always going to get a torus out of this, but you can see that all I really relied on here was that after reflecting a finite number of times, I got a translated copy of my original polygon. That is, that the, if I looked at the lines of the polygon through the origin, that the group generated by reflections is finite. That's an equivalent condition to the angles being rational multiples of pi. And that's a nice, easy exercise. This is another example. A very similar gluing drawing, if you just keep track of the barrier, gives you that this surface, if you start with billiards in this barrier, with the barrier, you get this uh, square. Again, the opposite sides are identified, and then you have a slit in each, in each square with the minus glued to the minus and the plus glued to the plus. This actually gives you a surface with two singular points, each with angle 4 pi. It's a genus 2 surface. Again. <clears throat> so this is one of the reasons people care about translation surfaces is billiards. Okay. So we've talked about billiards, we've talked about straight line flows, we've talked about IETs. Let me spend 10 minutes giving you an extremely quick crash course in ergodic theory, uh, because uh, all of the things I'm going to say are going to need the language of ergodic theory. Um, again, 
please feel free to go to sleep if you if you know all of this. I'm sure many of you do, but I feel like it's important to actually say it. Because everything we're going to do is, is sort of going to be in, in, in measure theory now. So, okay, if we if we have a measure preserving, if we have a measure space and a measure preserving map, all ergodic theory is is a, it's the study of long-term behavior of the orbits of the map. More generally, so this you can think of that as sort of the action of the semigroup N because you're looking at powers of T. More generally, you could look at the actions of groups or actions of semigroups on within a measure preserving fashion. So you have some space, you have some group acting on it, and you want to understand what happens to orbits uh, of this space. Um, and then we have a kind of irreducibility condition. So we're going to work. Uh, there's a very interesting infinite ergodic theory, and in fact, it does come up in translation surfaces, in particular in these irrational billiards, which lead to infinite translation surfaces. But everything we're going to deal with is kind of compact, so we're going to make an assumption that the measure of our space is one. Okay, so there's a finite measure. Uh, we say a measure-preserving transformation is ergodic if it's irreducible in some sense. That is, if you can't cut the piece up, the, the, the space up, into two smaller non-trivial pieces. That is. If you if you if you have an, an invariant piece, oh sorry, um, then it's trivial from a measure theoretic point of view. It's either measure zero or measure one. Okay. Uh, did I open both of these? Okay, hopefully not. Oh, I may have opened both the bottles of water. <laughs> okay. So the most important theorem in ergodic theory is the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, which is really an amazing theorem. So it says, suppose you have an ergodic measure-preserving transformation, and you take any integrable function on your space x, and then you take a point chosen at random according to your invariant measure. Then the time average converges to the space average. That is, you look at the, you add up the function over, as you hit it with this transformation t, it converges to the integral of the function on the whole space. This is a really, really amazing theorem. In particular, a, a good way to think about it is if you have the indicator function of a set, it says the amount of time the orbit spends in A is proportional to the measure of A. It's a great theorem, and it has a problem. The problem is, most of the time, you cannot make it into a statement about every single point. For, for, for sort of a typical ergodic system, you'll have, you'll have points that don't behave that way. It's a measure zero set. But, you know, in real life, when you're handed a point, it's very hard to tell where it, whether it comes from a set of full measure. For instance, it's not so easy to write down what's called a normal number, right? A number where all the digits appear with the right frequency. You know, every number we write down, in some sense, is, a set, is from a set of measure zero, right? Most of the time, we write down rational numbers. So... We'd like to have a statement that does better than just measure theory. Um, we'd like to make a statement about every point. So we need to bring in some topology. Okay? So now the next statement is going to be really a topological statement. So let's say we have a, a metric space. Um, in our case, it will be sort of compact. Uh, we say a Borel measurable map is uniquely ergodic <coughs> if there's a unique T-invariant Borel probability measure. So notice this is this topological statement. This is saying, you know, you have the action of T on your space X, it, then it acts on the space of Borel, Borel measures on X, and we're saying there should be only one, one sort of in fixed point for this action. Okay, an excellent, excellent exercise if you remember some functional analysis. Prove that if you have a continuous function on a compact metric space, and you have a, you have a uniquely... Ah, a uniquely ergodic transformation, then the conclusion of Birkhoff's theorem actually holds for every single point. The key idea is to use weak star compactness of the set of Borel probability measures on the space X. Uh, so I'm guessing, I guess now maybe I've added, yeah, X is compact, right? I added that assumption. So you use what's called the banaka logaloo theorem. The idea is Look at the measures supported on orbits, the probability measures supported on the first n points of an orbit, 1 over n times the delta measures. That's a sequence of measures. The set of measures is weak star compact, so it has to have a limit or some limit point. It's pretty easy to check that that limit point has to be invariant. 
and you're done. But it's good to work that out. So what's the point of this? The point of this is if you preserve, if you understand the set of invariant measures, if you understand, for instance, if you can prove that there's only one invariant measure, you actually understand every single orbit of the system. You understand the long-term behavior of every single orbit of the system. Okay? This is very powerful. This is very, very important. In particular, what's actually what's an example of a uniquely ergodic system that we've seen in already in today's talk? There is, you know, one example of, a, of an interval exchange that we talked about that was pretty clearly uniquely ergodic. Does anybody remember this? this that's right. The circle rotation with alpha irrational, Lebesgue is the only preserved measure. So in particular, that says if I look at a circle rotation, I know that every single point equidistributes as I, do, as, I, as I sort of follow it around. So the question is, can we say this about IETs? Can we say this about billiards? Can we say this about flat surfaces? So the question is, when is an interval exchange transformation uniquely ergodic? That is, when do they preserve only Lebesgue measure? Right? And the easy exercise is a rotation, is a, a, a thing is of two intervals is uniquely ergodic if and only if it is irrational. Right? If it's rational, you're periodic, you preserve lots and lots of measures. But if you're irrational, can you preserve you know, anything else? Fourier series is your friend in this case. You get to, there's a nice Fourier series proof. But let's, let's think about IETs a little bit. So what are some things to obviously rule out? One is, suppose your permutation fixes some subset 1 to k of 1 to n. Well, then you can cut your thing into two pieces. Right? But this is stupid. I mean, this is kind of a reducible kind of behavior. We could analyze each of the pieces on their own. So we might as well assume our IET is what's called irreducible. That is, there's no sort of, you know, I can't, my piece of string wasn't really two pieces of string, each of which I cut independently and permuted dependently. I'm actually permuting everything around. Another point is if there are points which have orbits which are not dense, then you could look at the closure of that orbit and there'll be a measure supported on that which will not be Lebesgue, right? If it's not dense, the closure will not be the whole thing. And so that's an obvious obstruction. Now, in the rotation case, that doesn't happen, right? It, the minute you're irrational, you are minimal and you're automatically uniquely ergodic. So uh, th there's a nice workaround for minimality, um, which we're kind of, it's not equivalent to minimality, but it's pretty close. Um, we're going to say that an interval exchange transformation T satisfies the IDOC, or the infinite distinct orbit condition. If the orbit, if the backward orbit of every discontinuity point you, is infinite and distinct. In particular, if you think about it, you can think about it in terms of if it comes from a translation surface, you can think about sort of seeing all the leaves that end up at the discontinuities and basically saying they don't connect up. Right? There's no sort of leaf that starts at one discontinuity and ends at another discontinuity. There's no what are called saddle connections, actually, is the other word for this. Um, so Keane's theorem is that if you satisfy the IDOC, then every well-defined for, uh, well forward orbit is dense. And we say in this case that T is minimal. This is a not easy exercise, but it's not impossible either. And if you care about interval exchanges, it's a really fun exercise. Prove Keane's theorem. I mean, Keane's theorem is a theorem, right? So this is not a trivial exercise. But... And, and then prove that if the lengths of the, of, the, of the intervals are linearly independent over Q, then T actually satisfies the IDOC. So this is a condition that you can kind of check. So I, I want to first state something purely in terms of intervals, and then I want to give you an interpretation in terms of surfaces. This is something that I feel like deserves to be better known in the surface community. So if you take an interval exchange of T of, of N intervals, then its kth power is an interval exchange of roughly n times k intervals. You can sort of see this by saying, oh, I, I erased my interval exchange. But if you sort of, you know, I, I had sort of 
you know, end discontinuity is when I sort of came back first, but then the number of leaves that lead to discontinuities will kind of get more and more the number of times I return to a segment. So, what, so there's roughly, it's growing linearly in the number of iterates. So what Bojernitsyn proved is he proved that if, let's look at the shortest interval for the kth power. If T is you not uniquely ergodic, then K times the shortest interval, the shortest interval is actually decaying faster than you would expect it to decay. Um, because there's K times N, N is fixed once and for all. There's roughly, so there's, just think of N as one if you want. So there's roughly K intervals in the kth power. So you expect each of them to be of size roughly one over K if they're all kind of the same. This is saying that the shortest interval is actually getting much, much smaller. So this is a, a, a condition of not unique ergodicity. So in particular, a condition for unique ergodicity is you just need to find a sequence of Ks for which K times MK is bounded below. And I want to turn this into a question. I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to prove Bojanitsyn's criterion, but I'm going to prove a, a surface version of, the, of it due to Howie Mazur in a bit. And in fact, Bojanitsyn's criterion can be used to prove the following really beautiful theorem. So Keen conjectured this, and then it was resolved originally by Mazur, Howie Mazur, and Bill Veach independently in the early 80s. Given an irreducible permutation on n letters, for Lebesgue, almost every choice of per length parameters, your interval exchange is uniquely ergodic. That is, it only preserves Lebesgue measure. For n equals 2, we knew this, this was known you know, in the 19th century, right? This is saying rational, irrational numbers are almost every real number, right? Like almost every real number is irrational. This is, for n equals 2, that's what this statement is. For higher n, this was only known in the 1980s. Okay, questions about the statement of this theorem? All right, so that was the end of my first 15-minute lecture, and I'm actually doing okay on time. So let me review so far what we've done. We've defined IETs. We've defined what a translation surface is. We've briefly discussed the idea of a moduli space of translation surfaces. We haven't really defined it very carefully, so discussed is maybe the better word. The idea that you can deform them. We'll talk more about that. We've discussed ergodicity and unique ergodicity. And we've stated Bojernitsyn's criterion. So what's our, on our agenda now? Our agenda now is to give a translation surface version of Bojernitsyn's criterion called Mazur's criterion. I want to explain what Rosy induction is. I want to explain what Lyapunov exponents are in this context. And I want to hint at a connection between the deviation of ergodic averages for interval exchange transformations and Lyapunov exponents for what's called the Kuntsevich storage curve cycle. That's going to be the punchline, probably, which we'll get to tomorrow. But let me start by connecting things to translation surfaces. OK. So what I want to, the, the, the pun, if you remember nothing else from this series of talks, this word renormalization is what I want you to remember. It's not used maybe in the sense of, well, I guess maybe, I, I don't know. It's, it's used in the sense of speeding things up, making things go faster. We're going to talk about dynamics on a translation surface, and we're going to talk about dynamics on the space of translation surfaces. And we're going to show you how dynamics on the space of translation surfaces gives you information about dynamics on individual translation surfaces. Okay, so this is going to be the key idea now in the, in the next thing. OK, so first, I need to tell you what a space of translation surfaces is. Um, so the first thing to, to note is that in a genus 2 surface, we had a, I showed you two examples, one where there is one singular point of angle 6 pi, and the other one where there is two singular points of angle 4 pi. That corresponds to my holomorphic one form having a 0 of order 2 and two zeros of order 1. In general, the z orders of the zeros of a, of a holomorphic one form have to add up to 2g minus 2. This is your favorite theorem about Riemann surfaces. You can make it, you can make it out of the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. 
by thinking about curvature being concentrated. It's sort of an orbifold uh, gauss bonnet theorem, but you can also really think about it as curvature being delta measures at these singular points with certain values or multiples of delta masses. Uh, or you can, you can do it in terms of Riemann rock as well. Okay? It's a, it's a, uh, if you like algebraic geometry, a holomorphic one form is a section of the canonical bundle on the surface. If you don't, you can just forget I said that. Okay? Um, you will not lose anything out of this talk if you don't know what that is. Okay, but so, so now what we're going to do is we're going to fix an integer partition of 2g minus 2, and we're going to consider the set of translation surfaces of genus G with singular points with angles with those angles. So this is a Riemann surface in a holomorphic one form with zeros of orders k1 through km. And of course, it's a moduli space. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider two of these things equivalent if there's a biholomorphism that takes. And, and this is the great thing with this font is the star ended up there. So I, you know, whether it's, it, I don't, I can never remember where stars are, whether stars are lower or upper, whatever's the correct one, right? It's in the middle. So uh, one of the one forms gets taken to the other. Um, so these strata of translation surfaces, uh, these are called strata. Let me uh, say that the, the topology of these strata is an extremely interesting question. Um, I know that, that uh, Subajoy and Shinpei are working on some problems related to the topology of these strata and how they look inside, because there's a projection map from these strata to moduli space of Riemann surfaces. That is, just forget the one form. So they're, they're, they're interested in some questions about that. Um, I should just point out that the questions about topology are quite hard. Um, this paper of Konsevich and Zorich that I mentioned, which shows that each stratum contains at most three connected components, that's a paper in Inventiones. So pi, computing pi zero is an Inventiones paper. I don't think we know what pi one is. Uh, I think it's an open conjecture, for instance, whether they are k pi ones, whether they are sort of very, you know, yeah. Um, but they show that most are connected, and from now on, I'm just going to think about a connected component of a stratum. An example of a stratum is if I take no singularities. Well, in that case, I have the space of holomorphic one forms on a flat torus, which is really, I just need to write the flat torus as C mod a lattice, and you know, that embeds my choice of direction in there. And I just take C mod a lattice DZ. So that means I have to pick a lattice. To pick a lattice in C or in R2, that means picking something in SL2R because I'm going to normalize all my surfaces have area one. I didn't say that, but let me say that. That means picking something in SL2R, and then to, you know, like the integer lattice Z2 is stabilized by SL2Z, so it's SL2R mod SL2Z. So this is a picture, there is a, a picture of a slice of a stratum. Okay. But now I want to tell you how to actually move around on a stratum. I want to tell you, you know, how to, how to spend some time on a stratum. Well, maybe before I do that, let me, tell you, well, yeah, let me tell you one easy way to move. One easy way to move is my surface, remember, also has this description as polygons with parallel sides glued. And remember, I'm normalizing things to have area one. So what's one thing I can do? These polygons live in the plane. Okay. Well, a matrix acts on the plane, right? Just Linearly. And so, so one important point is, I remember being terribly confused when I first started working on this, because whenever I thought, well, SL2R, surfaces, there should be some kind of fractional, no, no, linear action. Honest to God, matrix multiplication. C, think of C as R2, and just act by GP1, G, you know, act you know, on the space of translation surface, just transform your translation surface by the matrix. And the reason that we work with SL2R is because we're working with unit area translation surfaces. Um, so some examples of an action. Uh, there's a slight lie in this picture. Uh, if you take the regular octagon and you hit it with this shear, you can cut and reassemble it into this L-shaped table. This is actually, there's a, there's, then there's a scaling involved. So really, this is an example of the GL2 action. But uh, so. Below, a fun one, is the two surfaces are the same. If I hit the torus with 1101, I can cut this torus by just 
you know, cutting along the vertical and then gluing, doing the gluing I had, and I get the original one back. That is, SL2Z acts by an affine diffeomorphism of the torus. And in fact, any matrix in SL2Z acts by an affine diffeomorphism of the torus, right? 1101 has this picture, 1011 is just the picture rotated 90 degrees. So anything in SL2Z acts, stabilizes the torus. Okay, before, uh, yeah. So one important uh, word that I kind of mentioned earlier uh, was this idea of saddle connection. I mentioned this in the context of an IET when I said that one discontinuity could map to another that would correspond in my translation surface picture to a straight line that starts at one singular point and ends at another one. Exactly what we call those is uh, a saddle connection. Okay? They're called saddle connections because they connect these points with negative curvature. That is, they connect saddle points. Right? Saddle points are examples of points with negative curvature, so they connect saddle points. So the precise definition is a saddle connection on a translation surface is a geodesic that connects two singular points and has none in its interior. So for instance, all of these dashed lines are saddle connections, uh, including the one that goes halfway up the side. It then continues halfway up and, and, and goes from one thing to another. Uh, and then I have a, a very bad typo here. Uh, which is the holonomy vector of a saddle connection, gamma, so gamma is a curve. You don't integrate a curve, you don't integrate a curve along a one form, you integrate a one form along a curve. Gamma and omega are swapped here. You integrate omega along gamma, and that gives you a complex number. That tells you how far you went horizontally and how far you went vertically. Okay? It's literally just, you know, it's just that. Um, so given a translation surface x omega, we can define v omega to be the set of holonomy vectors of saddle connections on x omega. A really beautiful fact, and it's a good exercise to prove, is that this set is discrete if your translation surface is compact. It's not trivial, but you can show that if you have an accumulation point, you'd have to basically, your, your zeros would have to be sort of clustering together. Um, and almost by definition, this set is SL2R, or this assignment is SL2R equivariant. If I look at the translation surface G X omega, and I look at the set of saddle connections, it's just taking my set of saddle connections for X omega and hitting it with G. There's, there's, that's all you're doing there. Um, so I really like this picture. Oops, I didn't mean to rotate this. This was not what I planned, but okay. This is a picture of some holonomy vectors of saddle connections on a particular surface that I like. So you can kind of see that it's, it's discrete. It's kind of, it's got some interesting patterns to it. There look like there's some, some interesting symmetries. This one actually has way more symmetries than the typical one. This one is actually the orbit of a, of a HECA group on the plane. So it has a, it has a very big group of symmetries. Um, but you know, it's... So you can see some, some pictures. Um, an, important, an important fact is that, the, is that the, the saddle connections, or the shortest saddle connection, which is going to be very closely related to this Bojernitsyn condition, the shortest saddle connection tells you whether you're co uh, compact or not, basically, whether you're a subset if it, it, it is, is what measures whether a set, set of translation surfaces is compact. So it is, let L be the, uh, the set of, uh, uh, be the shortest saddle connection on your translation surface. And for any C bigger than zero, the set uh, where the length of the shortest saddle connection is at least C is pre-compact. This is kind of a version of Mahler's compactness criterion. Um, or Mumford, uh, sorry, of Mahler's from the space of lattices, or Mumford's on the moduli space of surfaces. You have to have a short saddle connection to go to, to, go to infinity in your strata. All right. So an important subgroup of SL2R, I think we can all agree that there's an important subgroup, is the diagonal subgroup. And this thing has... Uh, a really important name, a really important name here, it's called the Teichmuller geodesic flow, because if you hit your pair Riemann surface and holomorphic one form with this, 
what you're doing is you're, if you just think about your Riemann surfaces, you're moving along a Teichmuller geodesic. Okay. This is really, I mean, it, 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 this, I mean, this really does go back to Teichmuller in some sense, right? He said, you know, you have this extremal quadratic differential. Um, the, 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 maybe I should just make a remark. We're doing everything with the transition maps or translations. If you allow plus or minus one as a multiplication on Z, then DZ isn't preserved, but DZ squared is. And you get this whole world of quadratic differentials. A lot of the story that I'm telling you now can be done with quadratic differentials, except there's orientability issues, and you're not going to get interval exchanges. You'll get interval exchanges with flips and so on. But, but the idea is, you know, you're moving along a straight a length minimizing path in the moduli space of Riemann surfaces when you do this stretching. Okay, but what is GT doing on my translation surface? It's taking the vertical direction and it's taking a piece of length one in the vertical direction and it's making it a piece of length e to the minus t. It's making it much, much smaller, e to the minus t over two. That is, it's speeding up the vertical flow. So in particular, if I was interested in a very, very long piece of vertical flow or a long orbit of my interval exchange transformation on my original surface, I can now, I, maybe, I, maybe what I could do is I could instead do GT, and now my long piece of vertical flow is now a length one piece on a completely new surface. But maybe if my new surface was something I could understand, maybe something that lived in, I don't know, a compact set, it had reasonably kind of bounded geometry, it could say, oh, well, this length, moderate length piece on this moderate surface behaves in a reasonably nice way. Therefore, my original very long piece of trajectory behaves in some nice way as well. This is the idea behind renormalization. You speed up the vertical flow using the Teichmuller flow. So what we're going to do is we're going to write xt omega t for gt omega. And now... We're going to, I'm going to state sort of the surface version of Bozier-Nietzsche's criterion. It's, it really is actually almost the same thing. Uh, suppose the vertical flow on X omega is not uniquely ergodic. Then the length of the shortest saddle connection on this surface actually tends to zero as T goes to infinity. The length of the shortest saddle connection goes to zero. And remember, you might be saying, well, Bojanitsyn's criterion, you had this factor k. You wanted k times this interval to go to zero. But that k is sort of absorbed in the gt. The k is kind of the gt factor. Right? It's telling you the length of the shortest saddle connection is going to zero. So in red, I've written that is the non-divergence of the orbit of the translation surface on the space of translation surfaces gives you unique ergodicity on the original translation surface. So for instance, if I knew there was some compact set that I kept coming back to, I don't need to come back to some tiny compact set, just any old compact set, then my original surface would have a uniquely ergodic vertical flow. Uh, in the case of the torus, Mazur's criterion says, is, is very simple. In the torus, What's the only... Okay, so in the torus, you're either, your flow is either rational or irrational. If you're rational, that means your vertical direction has... You know, if rational direction is your vertical direction, it means you have closed leaves. So when you do the Teichmuller flow, you're crushing that closed leaf to zero, right? You're, just, you're, you're making that shorter and shorter. So that's not really a saddle connection, but it's a closed trajectory. So you have a closed trajectory going to zero. So in the torus case, you have to replace saddle connection with closed trajectory. And I should say, I have this word weak version because what Mazur actually shows is the length of the shortest curve goes to zero. He, he shows that you actually diverge in moduli space of Riemann surfaces, not just a stratum. It's, it's a stronger theorem. But in the torus case, it's the only thing that can happen. You pinch a closed curve to zero, otherwise nothing gets pinched to zero. Um, and this is the only obstruction to having unique ergodicity in the torus case. In general, however, uh, you can have minimal non-uniquely ergodic behavior. In higher genus surfaces, more complicated things can happen. Remember that billiard table I drew with the barrier, the square with the barrier? For appropriate choices of that height, you can find a big set of directions, theta, uh, which are minimal but not uniquely ergodic. This is, goes back to ideas of Veach and Mazur. In fact, you can get, build a big Hausdorff dimension set of directions. Not big from a measure theoretic point of view, but a big, big from a Hausdorff dimension point of view.
right? So this is that, that billiard table uh, with, with height alpha. For appropriate choices of alpha, you can have uh, directions for which you're minimal and not uniquely robotic. Uh, it, so, okay, if this, if on this, okay, so actually I can say a little bit about that. In, so, in general, you can look at this, fix a translation surface, you can look at the set of thetas for which the flow is minimal and not uniquely ergodic. Kirchhoff, Mazur, and Smiley proved that that's measure zero, the set of thetas. And then Mazur and Smiley proved a house surface dimension less than or equal to a half. And then John Chaika and I proved that in genus two, that the house dimension is equal to a half for almost every translation surface. And then Chaika and Howie Mazur extended that to all genus. Or, well, there's a slight lie, they're all hyperelliptic strata. We believe it's true everywhere. The combinatorics gets kind of nightmarish. So yeah, house dimension a half, basically, is the idea. All right. So I want to try, in the remaining five minutes, at least get started with, or the remaining three minutes, get started with the proof of uh, Mazur's criterion. So suppose we have two invariant measures, okay? Um, so, okay, first of all, if we're not minimal, we have a saddle connection. Let me rule out that kind of silly case first. If, you have, if you're not minimal, if your flow is not minimal, you have a saddle connection. If you have a saddle connection, of course, in the vertical direction, of course it goes to zero as you do tight polar flow. Right? That's not interesting. So now let's look at the minimal case. If we're minimal and not uniquely ergodic, we have at least two invariant measures. That's what it means to be uniquely ergodic. We, in fact, have at least two ergodic invariant measures. So a general fact in ergodic theory is the set of ergodic invariant measure. The set of invariant measures is sort of the convex hull of the set of ergodic invariant measures. The ergodic invariant measures are the extreme points. And now, what that means is each of these ergodic invariant measures, by the Birkhoff theorem, has some leaf which, which sort of reflects that, the behavior of that measure. So one will distribute with respect to your measure, or with, you know, let's say Argya and I each have a measure. One will equidistribute with respect to my measure, Argya will have a leaf which equidistributes with respect to his measure. In fact, if Argya picks a leaf at random according to his measure, he'll get a measure. If I pick a leaf at random according to my measure, I'll get a leaf that sees my measure. Okay, so there's two leaves that behave differently. Great. Okay, so let's now assume that I, I actually, so, 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 so I'm, what I'm proving right now is I'm going to say, suppose, I'm, I'm going to prove that suppose I have these two invariant measures and that I'm not diverging, and I'm going to derive a contradiction. So suppose the lim-inf of this thing is positive. That is, I keep coming back to some compact set. So that means if I keep coming back to some compact set, I can build a limit surface, right, along a subsequence at least. So when I say a limit surface, I mean a. Uh, I don't mean the. I mean there's some surface, along, you know, there's some subsequence of times t so that the surface is limiting onto the surface in this compact part. Let's call it S infinity. Remember, I have my two invariant measures, M1 and M2, on my original surface. And, of course, if they're distinct, there must be some, you know, some set that de detects that they're different. So there's some rectangle that detects that they're different. And in particular, there's leaves through points X and Y that visit this rectangle with these correct frequencies. That is, the, 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 the empirical frequency of my leaf living in, in the rectangle for, for leaf X and for leaf Y converges to this difference of the measures, which is non-zero. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, so yeah, that's right. For M1, almost every X. For M2, almost every Y, I'll have this. And so, but, in, but all I really need is just one X and Y. And maybe I should, oh, 10 seconds, all right. Whew. I'll, start, I'll, I'll, I'll go over this proof at the beginning of class next time as well. So now here's a picture stolen from Thierry Monte. So remember, I had these extremely long leaves on my original surface, and they're, they're starting at x, and they're starting at y, and on s. And so now I think of them on sort of the limit surface, and I think about limit points x infinity and y infinity. I'll, I might as well, also, I could also think about them on a surface kind of close to the limit surface, call it x, sn. 
On the limit surface, what we can do is we can find these points corresponding to x and y, which bound a rectangle with no singularities. Right? Kind of a small enough rectangle with no singularities. Maybe there's a singularity in the boundary somewhere. But in particular, they have to hit this rectangle in the same way. And so when I go back to the original surface, they had to hit the, the, inter, the, the rectangle in the same way as well. Right? I, I took this long and very complicated thing, and now I've made it this short, fat kind of, I mean, it's maybe quite wide, but I've made the, the long vertical leaf just a kind of a, a, a short thing. Uh, so I'm going to, you know, this is, I'm going to spend a lot more time on this. I don't want to try and rush this now. I'll spend, I'm going to start next time with this proof. But the idea is you build a rectangle on the limiting surface that has these two points on it. And that the, when you look at the, ver the leaves of the vertical flow, they hit ev this rectangle the same number of ways. And so when I move to the original thing, they're kind of hitting the original Q the same number of ways as well. So they couldn't have had different behavior in the first place. So this is Mazur's criterion. Um, the plan for tomorrow is to now go beyond. So unique ergodicity then will tell us that every point sort of at first order behaves the same way. Right? It, it sort of says that, oh, OK, well, if I look at the amount of time it spends in any set, it's the measure of the set. Well, what about the error term? What can we say about what the successive terms are? Um, and this is going to lead us to numerical experiments of Zorich and the idea of Lyapunov exponents. If you like geometry, what we're kind of doing is we're, we're, the problem that we're going to be looking at tomorrow is the following. Take your translation surface, take a long leaf of vertical flow, close it up by some bounded length segment. Think of that as a closed curve that is a vector in homology of the surface. How does that vector in homology grow? What can you say about it? as t goes to infinity. And we're going to do that, and we're going to try and answer that using this idea of a conservative George co-cycle. We're going to try and connect that to Lyapunov exponents. So I'll stop there. Any question? So let's thank uh, the speaker again.